As we continue with our series on the book of Hebrews, we are rapidly moving toward the more practical chapters from chapter 11, 12, and 13. And so the doctrine has been very, very important. A foundation has been laid in the book of Hebrews, and we sort of conclude with certain doctrinal thoughts and then integrating far more practical thoughts of what this means to us. And as we continue in the series, and the, the theme of the series is entering his rest, which is the theme of the book of Hebrews, that Christian rest, the rest for the believer, that place where you can be at rest in what Christ has done and at rest with Christ himself, which is very, very important. And today, we continue with that important thought of rest and of truth and of doctrine, but then really adding some beautiful practical thoughts. And the message today is entitled, A Life of Faith. And our reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 19 to 25. A life of faith. Therefore, always very important when it starts with therefore, it's saying the 18 verses before has laid a foundation, and because of this, we now have this. So, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. So the believer has been granted access into the presence of God. Now, that statement is a very Christian statement, and it's a very important statement, that the believer has been granted access into the presence of God. But to any other religion, and I'm not talking about atheists, to any other religion, that is a very arrogant statement to make. It's something that religion won't understand. Because every other religion is built on the premise of a separation between man and the divine. Now, yes, of course, when you go into Eastern philosophy where God is in you and you are in God, that's very strange. But when you basically deal with the concept of a God up there, it's always a separation. But the Christian makes the statement and the believer makes the statement and God's word makes the statement that the believer now is granted access into the presence of God. And according to Hebrews and specifically focusing on Leviticus 16, which is the day of atonement, the believer has access to God not only once a year, not only on special occasions, but every single moment of every single day. And I just put in my notes, how, question mark, how is this possible? How is it possible for the believer to be in the presence of God, to be able to have access to God, to approach God? Now, for us, once again, within a Christian framework, because we've had Christianity now for plus minus 2,000 years, we can all have this conversation, it makes sense. If we go back to the Old Testament, for the person, for a believer to say that they have access to God would be a very strange statement to make. Because you could not just waltz into the tabernacle or the temple and go into the Holy of Holies, could you? You could never do that. So how has the Christian now... And the believer, how do they have access to God? And the reason why and, the, and how this happens is because Christ is the sacrifice. Because Jesus Christ has given his life, he makes it possible now to have access with God or to God. Jesus Christ is also the mediator, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So he's our link. He's our mediator. 
He's also, according to the book of Hebrews, the high priest who is now at the right hand of the Father. So we approach God and we can approach God because of what Jesus Christ has done or accomplished for us. But I don't believe as Christians we appreciate that truth as much as we should. We just think, oh, well, it just should happen. Really? Most people just go to church. They go to a building and they hope for the best. They go to a building and they just go and they sing some hymns and they listen to some guy give a few thoughts and they go home. On a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you and I have access to God as much as we have on a Sunday. And that is a privilege, a privilege for us to pray, a privilege to us, for us to come before the Lord, a privilege for us to be drawn close to Him. And I don't know if we appreciate that in the midst of worrying about breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and life, and chaos. Because our lives do not revolve around our Christian faith. It doesn't anymore. Our life is consumed by so many other things. It's all of us. And God gets the Sunday morning if we manage to drag ourselves out of bed and if there's cornflakes. If, we do, if, we're making a, if there's a cooked breakfast, we've got no chance of making it always. And we come and we start the week by coming to church. And that's good. But it's not the Christian life. The Christian life is for you and I to recognize the fact that we have access to God and walking in Him, walking in His presence, even when you stumble and fall in the day, even when you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, you still have access to God. You don't have to continue in your day being the way that it is. You can stop and say, Lord, I don't want the day to take on this trajectory. I don't know if your day takes on that trajectory sometimes. We just know things are not going to go well yet this week or this day. And you can stop and say, I'm going to pray. I'm going to spend time with the Lord. Because we can enter into his presence. Now these truths about being able to enter into his presence, being able to come before him because of what Christ has done, these truths are beyond human understanding and also beyond human invention. The truth of the sacrifice of Christ, the truth that God himself has given his life to make fellowship possible and more than fellowship but intimacy is beyond our human understanding. And that is why when you read this text, there are three very important aspects to the Christian life and the life of faith that I leave with you today. And I believe all three of these thoughts are applicable. And it's something I want us to hold on to. Because what is a life of faith? It doesn't mean we have to be monastic or a monk. It doesn't mean that you have to separate yourself from people. But what is a life of faith? And I believe this text, these verses, give us three things. And I'm just going to highlight them before we look at the text. Firstly, a life of faith is having confidence. Confidence to enter into God's presence. The only way we can have confidence to enter God's presence is if we know what has been accomplished for us. And therefore, the first aspect to your life as a believer and my life is to stand upon the doctrine that the Bible shares, to stand upon the truth of what Christ has accomplished. It's not just the fact that Jesus died and my sins are forgiven, that's great. It's fine, it's good. But I can approach God and enter into his presence based upon what Jesus Christ has accomplished. And we need to know what that is. And have confidence in that truth. Every believer needs to have confidence in what the Bible says. If we don't, if we're not confident in what the Bible says, our Christian faith starts falling apart. So we have to have confidence to enter. So you stand upon doctrine. Secondly, we also have to have confidence in God's promises. And the confidence in God's promises is doctrinal, yes, but it's far more about trust. So I have confidence in what God has declared. Yes, that's the truth. But do I trust what he has said? It's one thing to believe what he has said. It's another thing to trust it. 
And the believer can have confidence in the promises of God and trust what he has said. And we fall into sin, not just because we are sinful and the flesh controls a lot of our lives, not just because of that, but we, we stumble and we fall and we fall into sin because we don't trust God. If you want to know what the poster child for this is, is Eve. I was like, but what about Adam? Yes, Adam as well. But Eve is the picture here. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, the whole principle or, or, the, or the foundation of what Satan says to Eve, the, the, the main thought there is, do you trust God? And, and, and Eve did not trust God. She didn't. She felt Satan deceived her in feeling that God has left, not left her, but God has cut her out and not given her the best. If we sin, it's because we follow our own way and we don't trust God fully. So we must have confidence to enter based upon the doctrine, but we also have confidence in the promises. So as we enter, we trust what he has done for us experientially. And then finally, how is this manifested in our lives? It is through the interpersonal connections where our trust in the doctrine, our trust in God's character and sharing that doctrine, our trust in in the promises he's made, is then manifested in, the, in our interpersonal connections. And what's very interesting about the text is that it's not speaking about your family. It's not speaking about work. It's not speaking about your friendship circle. Where is the first touch point and manifestation of our Christian walk is not in the world. And this is where I'd really sort of shake the tree with many Christians. Because I read the text here, and where the writer of Hebrews goes, he goes with the truth of what's being shared and the promises and trusting that. And then immediately, he doesn't go to, okay, live it out in the world. What does he say in these verses? Look at verse 24. And let us consider one another. Who's the one another there? It's God's people. If you want to know how directly your Christian faith is manifested in this world, it is how the church operates in how we treat each other. Because family, unfortunately, is just family. Family are connected with blood, but not connected in spirit. We as a church family and as believers, the way that our trust in God and the fact that we can enter and that spiritual life is manifested in our Christian community because you can't always speak to your family about things that are very important to you spiritually because they're not always going to understand. But we should be able to understand. And therefore, the church is very, very important. But it sometimes seems that people resent coming to church or they resent people in church. And that's not a reflection upon the people in church because trust me, people in church sometimes are a bit interesting. It happens. But it's not a reflection on the people in church. It's a reflection on our Christian walk. Because when we come to church, it needs to be I'm with like-minded people who also want to sing to God be the glory, who also sings it is well with my soul, who also can sing he will hold me fast. Even if I don't like the person, they can sing with me. And there's a manifestation of what the church is, which is God's people. And that's why I challenge, and I challenge us, if we say we're spiritual, and, we, and I mean, I don't want to take a knock at people because people have been burnt by church so much that they rather want to not go to church. But I find it very odd that you have people that are very proud of not going to church as Christians. It's not biblical. Do you have to go to church to be a Christian? No. It's the same as even if you're in church, it doesn't mean you're a Christian. The same as if I'm in a garage, it doesn't make me a car. So just because you're in church doesn't make you a Christian. But in the same way, the Bible draws us to gathering with God's people. If you're not going to be there, how are you going to live out your Christian faith? Because all we're going to do is it's going to be conflict every single day. Because when you speak to people that don't believe, it's conflict the whole time. God doesn't want us to live in conflict. The Bible says live at peace with everyone as much as possible. So are there times where there's conflict? Of course. 
Is there times when you share the gospel and it's difficult? Of course. But there must be a time when you can just take a break. And a break is coming to church and actually being with people that should agree with the gospel. If you're in a church that doesn't agree with the gospel, find another church. But church is important. And that's why I believe today, when we speak about a life of faith, what we have here is very important. Does Marlowe need you and me? No. Marlowe doesn't need us. Marlowe doesn't need the pastor, me, personally. But does Marlowe need Marlowe Baptist Church? Yes. And if you want to leave, that's fine. If I want to leave, it's fine. But God will make sure that this ministry continues. Why? Because we have a responsibility in this town. And that is to stand for the truth of God's word. God has raised a witness here. And each and every person that comes to this church is part of that witness continuing. It's part of the people across the road seeing us coming into this church. Why? Because God is important. Why do people come to Marlow Baptist Church? Because the Bible is important. We've got no smoke machines. I don't have a tattoo. Um, I have got to shave, but I don't have a long beard. And I don't think I'm cool. Although I think I'm cool, but I'm not actually cool. We are not a cool church. We're a church that believes in God's word and stands upon it. And that is important. So let's look at the text. I just find it beautiful. It's a beautiful passage. And I trust it'll be a great encouragement to you. Let's look at verse 19 and 20. Because firstly, we're going to consider confidence to enter God's presence. Confidence to enter God's presence. And verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness. The word boldness there is confidence. It's not arrogance. It's confidence. Therefore, brethren, having boldness or confidence to enter the holiest. Now, again, who is the writer writing to? He's writing to Jewish believers. He's writing to Jews who know the Day of Atonement, who know the tabernacle, they know the temple. For the writer of Hebrews, who is a Jew, to make the statement in verse 19, it is so profound to say to Jewish believers and Jewish people, that brethren, that is you, he's writing to, having confidence to enter the holiest. It's only one man who could enter the holiest, and that was the high priest once a year. No one can go in there. I mean, even in the Old Testament, when they carried the ark, and the ark fell, and a couple of guys tried to catch it, what happened to them? They died. But they were trying to do a good thing, yes, but they know they mustn't touch the ark. So for the writer to say, having confidence to enter the holiest, and why can you be confident? Where does the boldness come from? Does it come from self? Does it come from your own righteousness or your own holiness or being a good person? No, it comes by, what does the text say? The blood of Jesus. What does Paul the Apostle write about, of course, in the book of Galatians? I will boast in the cross of Christ. And so the writer tells us that there's been 18 verses now of doctrine shared, which we dealt with last week. And the key here is that there's one sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that makes atonement possible and makes it possible to have confidence to enter into God's presence. Turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. These verses we'll consider in our home groups as well this week. I didn't even think of that when I proposed that, but it's amazing how it connects. The Romans 5, 1 to 2. says, Therefore, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have, what? Access. By faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That word access there is access to God. Because of what Christ has done, because of our faith and trust in Christ's work on the cross and his finished work, there is confidence and there is boldness to approach and to have access to God. And based on what? What are, what are the merits? As I said, wh whose merits? It's not your merit. 
You don't waltz in. I don't know if anyone will know. You probably won't know, but it, it was just something that struck me. When I was a teenager, I used to listen to some funny music at times. Only, only sometimes. And then everyone's like, oh, how can you listen to it? If you've listened to the Beatles, you've listened to funny music. All right? They smoked funny stuff. They went to India as well. So don't judge the kids today. I'm going to talk about the, the, the Rolling Stones, but that's another conversation. But anyway, I listened to some funny music, and there was this German singer. Her name is Nina Hagen. And she actually sang the song where she basically said that she will rush into heaven and tear open the gates and look God straight in the eye. He's a bit of a strangey, of course. And the sad part is that that was that arrogance that she had as an atheist, like, who's God? And so the believer here can have confidence to enter into the presence of God, but on what basis do we enter? Do I enter on my own strength, my own goodness? Do I just waltz in there saying, you know, this is who I am? No, no, no. I enter, and we enter, with the blood of Jesus. I've trusted in the sacrifice, and therefore I can enter. And look at verse 20. So we can enter, and he says, by a new and living way. And I love this. This is beautiful in the Greek. By a new and a living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Now, what is the new and living way? What is, what is the whole book of Hebrews led us to see? That the old covenant passes away and that there is a? new covenant and the new covenant is living and better and it's something new and special and that's why in verse 20 he's using this picture of the new covenant of a new and a living way to be able to approach and to be able to come before god but what's so beautiful about the word new here is when you look at the greek it actually says new being something that is freshly killed that's what the word means. So new is not just new like we understand, oh, that's new, a new pair of shoes or a, a new coat. No, no, no. The new here in the Greek is freshly slain. So we enter the presence of God. We come before God in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, not in the old animals that had no power or purpose, but we come in someone's life that was given freshly slain, perfect, spotless lamb we can approach. But what's so interesting is look at the play on words, which I find interesting. So it says, by a new, which is something that's died fresh, fresh death, but then also in a living way. And the living there is something that is alive. So you have Jesus Christ who gave his life almost like a freshly sacrificed lamb or animal. That's the new. But then also it is living. It's a living way. It's a living person. It's someone that has died freshly, but someone that's also alive. So we come before God in the death of Christ, but also in his life. Not just in his death, because Jesus died and rose again. So I come to God in the presence of Jesus Christ, the high priest, with his blood, but also in the fact that he's living and at the right hand of the Father. So someone died, but someone is also living to make this possible. I find that fascinating. So by a new and a living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil. What is the veil? What is he dealing with here? Once again, it's atonement language, not so? You have the veil that separates the sanctuary from the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go into the veil that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil that tore in two, that now means there's access into the presence of God because of what Christ has done. So look at what he says. It's amazing. He says, through the veil. So there's, there's access now by a new and a living way which he consecrated for us through the veil. That is his flesh. So as the veil in the temple was torn in two when Jesus died on the cross, as that veil was torn in two, what happened to the body of Jesus Christ? His body was torn. His body was beaten. His body was broken. 
And that veil that separated man from God, Jesus Christ represents that veil in his body that is torn, his body that is broken, his body that was crucified. And because his body was broken for us, it made access to God possible. The imagery is just amazing. That the writer then goes there and says that Jesus Christ's flesh was torn for us. It is through Christ and Christ's work, through the cross, his death, that we can now enter into God's presence. Because who made this possible? And this is key. Who makes it possible for us to enter into the presence of God? And yes, it's Jesus, but I want us to think bigger, bigger picture. Who makes it possible? Who makes it possible for us to enter? Who wants us to enter? God himself. God's not cutting us off and like, oh, you have to go, you have to jump through six million hoops before you can come to me. It is God who gives his life. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, and so what I find difficult sometimes when I look at that is the picture we paint of the gospel, the picture that Christians paint is God doesn't want anything to do with people. He just wants anything, he wants something to do with me because I'm so special, but the rest of the people he doesn't care about. When here, he sends the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ gives his life. His body is torn and broken to make access to God possible. It is God that is the gracious one. God that wants to bring us close. And yet at times, even Christians feel cut off from God as if he doesn't care. How much does God care? Look at Christ. And so the first part of a life of faith is to stand upon the truth that Jesus Christ is the only sacrifice, that Jesus Christ's death and resurrection makes this possible. That is doctrine. That is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 4. That's the gospel that Jesus died and rose again. And through his death and resurrection, we can have peace with God. It's not only Romans 5, 1 and 2. It's also, of course, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. From verse 17 to 21, that now in Jesus Christ, we have reconciliation. Do you trust that? Do I trust that? Yes, I trust that. And I have confidence in that. I have confidence to, have, to be able to approach. And then secondly, we have confidence in God's promise. And that's from verse 21 to 23 and look at verse 21 having a high priest over the house of God so we have boldness to enter because Jesus Christ is the sacrifice I come with his blood but I can also come with his blood yes but also with the confidence that he is the high priest he's the one that is my mediator my advocate the one that pleads my case and having a high priest over the house of God because Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father. And so because of this confidence in the blood of Christ, in his role as mediator, as priest, as advocate, as savior, as Lord, a lot of those titles are given to him. Because of that, I can approach. And here's the key for you and for me. Verse 22. Look at the language. Let us draw near. Very interesting language, isn't it? I think it is. Who's the onus upon there to draw near? Jesus Christ has given his life. God has made it possible. He's done all the work. He's made the sacrifice. He's brought salvation. Now, in my state of being saved in the blood of Christ, in my state of being justified with God because of the work that he has done, what is my responsibility now in verse 22? Because the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies. The high priest could draw near, and the people then see the high priest as almost representing them and representative, because that's what a priest was. A priest was representing the people. But now it's not saying, let the priest draw you near. It's not saying, let the church draw you near. It's not saying, let the pastor draw you near. It's saying, let us draw near it's your responsibility as it is mine 
The work is done. We know the doctrine, but the doctrine doesn't draw you near unless you draw near. Let us draw near and draw near with what? With a true heart. So I find this interesting because the emphasis here is on the believer drawing near. So there must be volition involved here. It's not God doing fishing. And it's not drawing people. It doesn't say God draws. It says you must draw near. There must be volition involved. A surrender. A desire to draw near. Look at, ver look at uh, James 4 verse 8. I think it's going to be on the screen. James 4 verse 8. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Very interesting. It's going to connect with this, this next part of the verse. But draw near to God. And I ask all of us, this is not a you and me, this is all of us, are we drawing near to God daily? And look at the language. The language is atonement again. It's to be in the presence of God. It's to be able to come to Him. It's to be able to draw near to Him. Because we live our lives and then tragedy strikes and then we want to pray. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can pray when tragedy strikes. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying there's a daily aspect here to draw near to God. The onus is upon us to daily surrender, daily draw near. And the Holy Spirit will help us with that, of course. He's the one that gives us the strength to do and to will. We understand that. But there is a volition from our side to surrender and humble ourselves and draw near to God. And to draw near with a true heart. And the word true there is for sincerity, a sincere heart. Not a hip hypocrisy or hypocritical heart, not a double-minded heart, but to draw near with a true heart. Look at the language. A true heart in full assurance of faith. You can't draw near unless you have the first part. You can't draw near to God unless we have verse 19 and 20. Because that's what assurance is here. When you have the assurance of what Christ has done and that you hold, you appropriate, you hold that for yourself. This is the truth of what the gospel is, of what Christ has done. Now I can step forward. Now I can draw close to him because I come with confidence and with boldness because of the truth. So doctrine is important. It is vital. If we come to church and we're not interested in doctrine, that's fine. But you're never going to be able to truly draw near to God because we base our drawing on truth and on doctrine. Intimacy with God is based upon the stepping stones to get there, which is based upon the truth of God's word. So let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And then these two things. I just want to go back, Jim. Sorry, can we go back to James 4 verse 8? Very quickly, very briefly. Who's James writing to? It's very simple in the book of James. We just did that as a church and Bible study. You can go listen to it. But who's James speaking to? Is James speaking to the world or to believers? If you look at verse 1, he writes to believers. So he tells believers to draw near to God. Not saying to the world, saying believers. Draw near, which is that intimacy closeness, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. That's us. Not unbelievers. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's us. We are double-minded. Why? Because we're a bit in the world, a bit in Christ, a bit distracted. We are double-minded. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm just saying it doesn't mean you're evil or terrible. It just means that it shows that we're sinners. As believers, we are drawn away. And the same language in verse 22, it says, Now in full assurance of faith, having your hearts sprinkled from, an e from evil conscience, and your body's washed with pure water. Look at the terminology in James. Cleanse. The word cleanse is used there. Now, what is the word cleansed used for? Is it used for salvation in the fact that you are a sinner that needs to be cleansed to be saved? No, because he's speaking to believers. So the word cleansing there is not in reference to your initial salvation. The word cleansing is to your daily walk. Now, I used this before. Now, there's one thing that's so funny is when I want to sort of buy a chocolate for myself, and this is a, this is a joke, so don't take it, don't 
it's not gospel this at all. But sort of when I want to cut corners, I go to the shop and I want to buy a chocolate and I've got X amount of money. Um, I buy the cheap dishwashing liquid at Sainsbury's. You know the Sainsbury brand? And then Vera just rolls her eyes at me. Because you know what happens with that? For one wash, you have to take all of it. It's rubbish. But when you buy a ferry, it's doop, done. Now, I use that example because you know what the Word of God is like. The Word of God is like spiritual detergent for your heart and your mind. Every single week, Monday to Saturday, we're out in the world. We get polluted and we get affected by the world. It's what happens. But when we spend time with the Lord, we go to His Word. It doesn't just mean a sermon. That, no, sermon's extra. I'm talking about daily. Come to His Word. Spend time with Him in prayer. What does God's Word do to our lives and hearts? It renews our mind and cleanses us. So that's the, the language here that the writer is, is bringing into it. Because who was sprinkled before they entered into the temple or the tabernacle? Who was sprinkled? The high priest. Because there's a big bronze, they call it a laver, with water in and the ash of the heifer. They, they, they sacrifice the, the heifer and they take the ash and throw it into the water. Before the priest enters in, he takes that, he sprinkles himself and ceremonially is clean to go in. What is it that cleanses him? The water or the ash? The ash, not the water. Because you need the sacrifice to bring the cleansing. Water doesn't cleanse anyone. It's the ash in the water that gives it efficacy. So that's why the writer is, is imposing this language here, to be sprinkled. So the same way that we daily need to cleanse ourselves with what Christ has done. Sprinkle your heart from an evil conscience, and then also, and wash your bodies with pure water. Does it mean physically to wash yourself? No, it doesn't. Because what is the thing... What are the two things that we live in this world with that can be affected by sin? It's the heart and the body. How many times does Paul write and say to the churches, bring your members into subjection? He's not talking about pastors bringing members into subjection. When he speaks about members, he talks about hands, feet, eyes, ears, your body. Paul the Apostle writes in 1 Corinthians 9 and says, I run this race, and what I do with my body is I bring it into subjection so I can run faithfully. So what we need to do is we bring our hearts and our minds into subjection to Christ because this can be polluted, and our bodies can be polluted. So the writer is saying, sprinkle your hearts and your minds from an evil conscience and spiritually wash your bodies with pure water because the priest would sprinkle himself as well when they went into the tabernacle, but also on the Day of Atonement, and you'll see it here in Leviticus 16, 23 to 24, just, just go there, what the priest also would do. So it says here, Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting and shall take off the linen garments uh, which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his body with water in a holy place, but on his gar put on his garments, come out and offer his burnt offerings and the burnt offerings of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. So before Aaron would, or the high priest would make the sacrifice, take off the clothes, wash yourself, and then you're prepared to, take, to make the offering. So you'd have to sprinkle and wash. And he's using this symbolically to say that as God's people, as believers, we need to cleanse our minds and cleanse our bodies physically. Not wash yourself, but be separate from that which is evil. Because that's what it is. We have to draw near. And as I draw near, I have to focus on cleansing my mind and my body not being part of evil. And then I can approach God. And it's very, very important. And then verse 23 says... And this, once again, it's instruction. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Now, again, is this conditional language? No, it's not. And that's what really gets me worked up when it comes to the Bible, where English is a very strange language at times. Everything seems conditional in English. That's the way we speak. 
The Bible is not written in English. It's Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And in Greek, it's not always conditional language. And this is not conditional. What this is saying, it's encouragement language. So it's saying, let us hold fast to the confession of, of our hope without wavering. For he, has prom he who has promised is faithful. So the writer of Hebrews is encouraging the believer to hold fast. It's not saying if you don't hold fast, you lose your salvation. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying hold fast. And I use the same as with, with, with Harry, my son. I encourage him to do things. If he doesn't do, it doesn't mean I don't love him anymore. I just encourage him to do things. The Bible encourages us to do. But unfortunately, we are so insecure as Christians often, and because we've of bad teaching and, and ministers who are super holy and always makes everyone else feel like they're not holy enough. And they use the scriptures to make us constantly feel it's do this or do this or do this or as if we're living under the Mosaic covenant. And it's supposed to be a new covenant that's not based on or, or, or. And yet in verse 23, he's encouraging believers to hold fast in their walk as believers. But look at the last part of the verse, which is key. So I hold fast without wavering why for he who promised is faithful does it speak about your faithfulness or god's faithfulness who is the one that's faithful in the text for he the he there is in capitals so the he is god for god who promised is faithful god is faithful it's not about your faithfulness it's about god's faithfulness which is key. So we can have confidence to draw near. We can have confidence to really be close to God because of all that he has done. And then finally, verse 24 and 25 is the practical outpouring of this. And that is the consideration for God's people. Consideration for God's people. Look at the verse. And let us consider. And that consider there means to care or show compassion and care. Let us care for one another. Let us be concerned. Why? What is our responsibility to each other? In order to stir up love and good works. I'm just going to focus on verse 24. Look at the one another there. One another there is believers. It's believers. But who, who is your main focus here? It's not about Christian unity now. Please, that's not what this is talking about. It's not saying believers everywhere. It's saying your local believer group. And I know that because the next verse will tell you this. It's talking about us here at Marlow Baptist Church and those who are part of this ministry. We have a responsibility to each other. And we have a responsibility to encourage each other. But look at what it says here, to stir up. And the word stir up in Greek basically means to sharpen. It means to stimulate or it means to provoke. In a good sense, not a negative sense. So to stir up, to encourage, to sharpen, to stimulate. What? Let's see what it says. To stir up, love. And in Greek, the love there is agape. It's God's love. So it's not talking about loving each other. Otherwise, it would have used the term filio. Filio is love between people. This is agape love. What's he talking about? He's saying that we must encourage each other. We must sharpen, stimulate, and provoke each other to love God more. To draw closer to him more. To be encouraged in Christ more. It's not loving people. It's not charity and brotherhood. It's talking about specifically. It's saying that we must encourage each other as God's people. So our worship is more focused. Our worship is directed. Our lives are focused on Christ. We should be encouraged among each other to focus on Christ. So that's what love is. It's God's love. It's worship. It's God-focused. And the same with, with good works here as well in verse 24. It's not just to love God more, but it's also to have good works. What are the good works? It's quite interesting. The word there is not charity once again, but it's godly character. It's encouraging each other to be God-focused and have godly character. When you are God-focused and you have godly character, what comes naturally from that? 
good works and care for each other. But that's not the focus here. The focus is not that we love each other more and do good things. If you want to be a social gospel person, you can use those verses out of context and say, well, the Christians must just show love and do good things for the community. That's not what this is saying. This is talking about love toward God and good works as in the pouring out of godly character, that we are encouraging each other to grow in God's word, grow in God's truth, and manifest godly character. So a few verses I just want to highlight here about God's people. I want us to think through that because I think it's important for us to be reminded of the care that we must show to our fellow believers. Because if we cannot be considerate toward people in church, some who are difficult at times and others who are not, but if you can't show consideration to God's people here, we have no hope in surviving. But maybe you feel more comfortable with the atheists, because I don't. I don't want to spend time with people that blaspheme God and talk about nonsense the whole time. If you do, then it's fine for you, but I prefer being with God's people. That doesn't mean that we mustn't be out there. You must be out there, but are you comfortable there? Are we too comfortable in the world? This should be a place of comfort. This should be a solace. This should be an oasis for us to come to in the midst of the desert and the wilderness of the world, to come here and just Breathe and encourage each other. A few verses, Romans 12, 10, 1 Peter 1, 22, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 to 10. Just to emphasis here on God's people. Be kindly affectionate to one another again with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Who's the one another? It's the person sitting next to you in the pew here. It's not talking about people out there. It's the one another here. Okay? Move on. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Do you see the emphasis once again there on the brethren? And then the final verse. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are who are all in Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. The emphasis is on loving each other. If we want to be spiritual, if we want to say we're spiritual, then we don't cut ourselves off from believers, but we embrace what, what life in a church is. And if you're not happy here, by all means, then go somewhere where you might be able to be happy, but Hopefully you're happy here. The word of God is being taught. So let's try and minister to each other. And then finally, verse 25 says, now look at the context again. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. And the word forsaken, forsaking there is to leave or abandon. We're not supposed to abandon the assembling of ourselves together. And I'm not going to go on a lockdown rant about this issue. But it was the first issue that was very interesting. It was very easy for Christians to say we're not going to go to church anymore. It was like not even a fight. It became a fight after a year. But they just had to drop the hint of stay at home. Everyone's very happy to stay at home and listen to church in their pajamas and a cup of coffee. Was no, 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 this is not right. And what does the Bible say? Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And the word assembly there is very interesting. The word assembly there in the Greek is episynagogue, where you get the word synagogue from. It's the gathering of people together. So it's not speaking specifically of the body of Christ, they're not saying the ecclesia, it's saying the episynagogue, which basically means. Just a gathering of people, the gathering. So let us not forsake the gathering, the physical gathering of us together. And the word episynagogue actually means the gathering for a specific purpose. It's a godly assembly. But the key here is it's a godly assembly because what the Greek definition is, it's a godly assembly who gather together and that is of one mind. One mind, unity in the truth of God's word and truth. And we're going to conclude. 
assemble ourselves together, as is the manner of some, some don't want to meet, that's wrong, but encouraging or exhorting one another. So we need to encourage each other. And so much more as you see the day approaching and the day there's judgment, the day there can mean the second coming, it can, but it's more focused on as we see judgment approaching, as we see the world coming to a more difficult place. So the day there biblically often is used more for God's judgment. So as we see judgment is coming, we must gather together even more and be encouraging of each other as the day approaches. And what was so interesting is, as we conclude, is as the writer wrote this, his pen was barely dry. In 70 AD, the, the Jewish temple was destroyed, which is the final judgment on Israel as a people. And so they realized how important it is to gather. And I think for us as well, I think after COVID and after lockdowns, we came together and it really is very special to be gathered with God's people. So let us celebrate and rejoice in this. So finally, as we conclude, it's the doctrine we must know and have confidence in. It's also the promises because we know the doctrine. We draw close based upon the promises and the trust of God. And finally, it's also that that flows out into our consideration for each other. And I trust that you can do that. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, we thank you for your truth, and we thank you, Lord, for what you have declared to us today. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us as your people to stand firm on these promises and live a life of faith. Help us, Lord, to not doubt. Help us not to waver. Help us, Lord, not to be distracted, but help us to focus on you. And if we do feel a bit distracted, if we have become sidetracked by things of this world, help us, Lord, to just draw near to you. Because we know, Lord, that as we draw near, you will be there. And just help us, Lord, to trust you. So I pray for each and every person here today. I pray that they will trust in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ, the cross and the work that was accomplished. And I also pray, Lord, that we will draw near to you daily. We just thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word to us today. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please stand for a concluding song.